be here. I would like to challenge you this early afternoon to think about art in a new way. I challenge you to embrace the proposition that art can and should be functional in society. No problem, you might be thinking. Where's the controversy? Well, 200 years ago in Europe, at the birth of the Romantic period, philosophers decided for the first time in history that art should have no function other than providing an aesthetic experience. That's why we now make a distinction between art and design. That's why these days real art is for its own sake, not yours, buddy. Now you may notice that some artists try to get around this by creating work that they think the public wants. It's called commercialism. And according to people of taste, it is a pollutant. Arts organizations, most of them not for profit, get funding in order to protect their work from this pollution, to protect it from utility. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we should get rid of arts funding, and I do not mean to imply that aesthetic experiences can't be life-changing. But what I am saying is that our whole economic and philosophical art philosophy needs to be updated, especially these economic systems that have developed around it. Because today's artists are confused and we feel impotent. Time and again we are told, don't make stuff that people can use, otherwise you are not a real artist. Just do nothing but create a masterpiece and um, get a day job, because how else are you going to support yourself? In order to, I uh, started to think about this stuff a few years ago. In order to fill you in on my process, I am going to use a piece of art. This is the first scene of a play that I wrote called Collaterally Damaged, and it is a true story. My name is Henja Milstein. I was 10 years old when the war started in Poland. I am going on a journey to Poland. In 1939, the Germans came into our little town and they started bombing the city. In 1982, I conducted this interview with my mother. I will use this interview as the basis for my trip because in this interview, my mother explains what happened to her during World War II. But how shall I explain to you my mother? My mother walk the streets in a bathing suit, false eyelashes, and a large velvet hat. My mother vacuumed her nose with the hose of a canister vacuum because she thought that this was the best way to relieve her sinus congestion. On New Year's Eve 1995, my mother stood outside the nursing home where my father was. She told her entire life story to two total strangers. She did this a lot. At the end of her story, she gave her fake leopard coat a little tug, glanced over at her broken down Mercedes and said, I didn't do too bad. Six hours later, she was dead. A heart attack in the back seat of her German machine. A poetic ending to a remarkable life. It is now 10 years later and I am going on a trip to Poland, tracing my mother's journey there during the Holocaust. When I return, I will write a play that will change the world. I trace my aspiration back to the year 2000. Back in 2000, I had recently returned to the US after living five years in the European city of Prague. One day I found out that a theater in New York was holding something called Never Again, a town meeting on genocide. What's not to love? <laughs> At the meeting, Philip Rosenberg was there. He's a renowned journalist who wrote a renowned book about the genocide that happened in Rwanda in 1994. Two other journalists spoke about their experiences in Bosnia and Cambodia. After listening to these people, the audience rose up, our voices. Please, we are set designers and dancers and writer-directors. Surely there must be something that we can do. Please, tell us what we can do. The answer came back to us unanimously. Nothing. But we are artists. Finally, Philip Rosenberg spoke to us plainly. Listen to me. I know you would like to do something. We would all like to do something. But the phrase never again it's a lie! 
If an individual or a group wants to murder, there is nothing anyone can do. Not the so-called international community. Not the United Nations. Not journalists and not artists. There is nothing anyone can do but stand by in horror. <laughs> I was stunned. In the Czech Republic, when I'd been living there, the president was a playwright. Of course, theater had huge social value. So why couldn't it eradicate or even prevent this kind of suffering? Maybe it could. Then again, in the last few years, the world has gotten pretty wacko, despite many lovely theater productions. There's been, oh, let's see, daily terrorism, the war on terrorism, war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq, genocide in the country of Sudan, in the region of Darfur, where more than 300,000 people have been murdered and more than 2 million people have been displaced. Well, 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 I don't know about you guys, I think this stuff has been going on long enough. That's why I will go to Poland in order to stop all of it. Yeah, the way I'm thinking about it, my play will at least discourage war, murder, rape, torture, genocide, definitely genocide, and even annoying acts of rudeness. Some people think I'm deluded, including Theater Communications Group. Dear Laura, as the intern at a large nonprofit organization, I was given the task of writing your rejection letter. The panel agrees your grant proposal was straightforward. They recognize that your project would provide for personal growth, but they needed more information about how your trip would impact those in Prague. Okay, now I have no funding, or maybe I just wasn't deluded enough. I decided to become a Fulbright scholar. Dear Ms. Lam, the review committee is operating under the guidelines of the President of the United States. I have recommended applicants for Fulbright Awards. I regret to inform you that your application for Poland is not one of those recommended for consideration. <laughs> well, now I really have no funding. That's why I do what any intelligent woman would do in my place. I max out all my credit cards and then I call a guy who can help me. Not just any guy, but Alex, my ex-boyfriend. He's a Czech video filmmaker. Hey, Alex, hi, it's Laura. Listen, what are you doing this summer? You want to visit some concentration camps with me? I'll pay. I, I, I know you don't want me to pay, but you're broke and I'm broke. But Bank of America is not broke. Listen, Alex, we have to do this because art theater is potent, even individual pieces. Anyway, will you travel with me, protect me from thugs, carry heavy stuff, and document the whole thing with a professional video camera? Yes? I know, I'm pathetic, but who cares? I am an artist. That's why on August 1st, 2005, I set off for Poland. It is the 60th anniversary of the end of World War II, the 10th anniversary of my mother's death, and I'm traveling 5,000 miles to write a play that will end all genocide. Do I know how I will do this? No. Do I think I can do this? No. Am I going to do this? Yes. Up yours, Philip Rosenberg. <laughs> That's the first scene from my play. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, in the end of the play, my character realizes that she cannot stop the genocide in Darfur, but she can spread a message of compassion. For two years, I performed this play. I even started to make some money off of it, but only once I decided I needed to turn it into a commodity because I had to pay back my credit cards, you know? But then something uh, strange happened. I began to realize that while I was on stage talking about the genocide in Darfur, real Darfuris were dying at that very moment, and my play was not helping. It might have even been hurting. See, just by bringing up such a desperate situation, my audience felt helpless. In other words, art by itself in that instance seemed irresponsible. In response, I started something called the Collaterally Damaged Project, which is an umbrella that houses my play, but also a host of other endeavors. Collaborations with contemporary genocide survivors, a media project where I could highlight appropriate nonprofits, the sale of goods made by refugees, 
workshops on developing empathy in the workplace. Most importantly, I began donating a portion of my artist's fee to post-genocide recovery efforts, and in this way, every time I performed, I could directly help survivors. All of this seemed so innovative to me, until I looked around, and that's when I saw that while the art world was busy protecting itself from capitalism, the rest of the world was starting to use capitalism in order to fund socially conscious actions, often those benefiting the most vulnerable on our planet. This practice has a name I would like to see applied to the arts. It's called social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship offers artists a full spectrum of opportunities, from market-driven work to masterpiece to volunteerism. Artists get to do all of that, as long as we can find a fluidity between art and design, commercial and non-commercial, entertainment and education, between monologue and the talk that is built around it. These days, among other things, I teach other artists how to be social entrepreneurs, or as I say, make art, make money, make a difference. Let me tell you, these people are ready to serve. They are ready to serve because service is clearly a huge part of our global zeitgeist. In fact, I think Ted has been particularly helpful in spreading the message. I just apologize that it's taken us artists so long to read it. But now that we have, I'd like to say to you all, use us, use our art. We offer poetry and song, but also conflict resolution and healing practices. We're really good at nuance, emotion, communication, transformation, speaking in this holistic vocabulary. We have so much to offer and we have so much to learn from you. I think it would be great if we could challenge each other through these kinds of innovative collaborations. In the spirit of TED, I say, let's talk. Thank you.